Hello, this is Daniel Dolphin with Dolphin Horsemanship, and we're here today to talk about bits a little bit. Um, first of all, I want to give this kind of have an introduction of things that are important with regard to all bits. Uh, this video is also going to take care of snaffle bits. So if you want to see any of the other videos that I'm going to do, we'll do another one on transition bits, and then the last one will be on curb bits and things like that. We may come back later and do another one on uh, on some of the miscellaneous stuff that doesn't quite fit in those categories. But this one is got to have all of the basic information that will pertain to all of the other types of bits. So please be sure you watch this one thoroughly. Um, first of all, there are seven pressure points on the horse's head that we use to communicate with him through our reins. No matter what type of uh, bridle, head stall, whatever you've got on there, hackamore, you're going to use one or, or a combination of these seven pressure points. Uh, they are the tongue, which is self-explanatory, the bars of the mouth, which sometimes people don't understand. That's basically the, the lower jaw gums of the horse in that gap between the front teeth and the molars. That area would be called the bars of the mouth. And then we have the corners of the mouth, so basically the lip area. Uh, the other one inside of the mouth would be the palate or the roof of the mouth. Uh, we would also then have the chin, uh, which, which could be two different areas. There's an area called the chin groove, which is right behind the bulge in the lower lip of the horse, and that's where a curb chain for a uh, leverage bit would work. But also further up the jaw, but also on the, the lower side of the jaw, uh, a hackamore. Would, would work in that place. When you're pulling back on the heel knot of a hackamore, you'd still be using the chin as part of your communication points. It just would be four or six inches higher up than the chin groove where a curb chain would be. Uh, then we also would have the nose of the bit. Uh, again, a hackamore, bosol type rig would, uh, would use that, or also a side pull, something along those lines. And then finally, the pole. Um, so, we'll get into snaffle bits. This is a snaffle bit. Okay? Uh, this is not. Uh, what the defining characteristic of a snaffle bit is, is that it does not have any leverage. Alright? So this is an Argentine shank, what I would call a, a, a transition bit, and it, it brings in leverage. Uh, this bit is an O-ring snaffle it has no leverage. So people will very frequently uh, incorrectly refer to a bit like this as a snaffle. I hope y'all can see that well. And, and it in fact is not. You might, you might sometimes hear this term, a shanked snaffle. I wouldn't argue with that. Um, they're generally calling it that because of this type of mouthpiece, a broken mouthpiece, which in fact the snaffle, a true snaffle, does not need to have okay. in order to uh, still be so this video is, is about snaffles specifically, but, but it, with the all-encompassing part of all bits, all bits have certain things in common, hackamores, whatever. Uh, the most important part of every single bridle you'll ever use is these right here. Uh, we're going to, we unfortunately use terms like mild versus severe when we're describing bits, and I, I'm going to I'm going to kind of stay with that, but I really, really, really want everybody to understand that no bit, bridle, hackamore, what have you, is severe unless the hands holding the reins are severe. Uh, you could also say these snaffle bits, universally regarded as the mildest of all bits, uh, hands down, I have seen more damage, more cut tongues, more bruised mouths and all that with snaffle bits than all other bits combined. Uh, that's not to say that they aren't mild, but the hands holding the reins are really the determining factor there. So if you learn nothing else from this video, please take that home, that the only severe part of any bridle at all is the hands holding the reins. Uh, certain bits might have the potential to be more severe, but no bit is severe until someone pulls on it. Right. Let's absolutely take that home. Now, uh, we're going to get into some of the aspects of the bit. Um, <clears throat> these first three that I'm going to name off, I'm going to call the most important. Uh, and, and the reason for that is 
no matter how poor or skilled your hands are with the reins, these factors have nothing to do with you. The horse can't help it, you can't help it. This is all about setup, okay? The first one is the adjustment of the bit in the horse's mouth. Uh, how many of us hear that old adage about one wrinkle or two or whatnot? Uh, that's in the corners of the horse's mouth. Uh, I would say, generally, no wrinkle. Um, the, the ideal way for a horse to be carrying a bit is to actually sort of pick it up with their tongue and they would even be sucking on it a little bit so that that broken piece of the mouth would be maybe even pointing up just a hair rather than hanging down like so as we're riding. Um, or hopefully, yeah, y'all can see that there. It would actually be up in the horse's mouth like this a bit rather than hanging down like so. Um, so when we have a horse wrinkling a little bit in the corners of the mouth, that is pressure from the bit that the head stall is putting on. Uh, it's not pressure from my hands. So it's pressure that the horse can't get away from. So if I have a wrinkle or two in the, the corners of my horse's mouth, I am essentially asking him to deal with, tolerate, and most importantly, ignore that pressure right there. As we'll get into further in this video, uh, a horse really working light is actually going to be responding primarily off of just contact at the corners of the mouth. It, so if I have him already ignoring X amount of pressure there, he certainly has to be heavier than that. I, I would highly, highly encourage you to try uh, lowering your bit just a hair. Now, we would not want it so low uh, that, that this part hanging down could come into contact with the horse's front teeth. I mean, everything within moderation and reason but certainly don't want my horse smiling either. Uh, that does not go to what I call a happy mouth, and I want a horse to have a very nice, relaxed, happy mouth. Most of the people that are riding around with their horse smiling also have to put a cavasson or some type of device like that to keep that horse's mouth cranked shut uh, to mask the symptoms of an unhappy mouth. Uh, highly, highly encourage you to do that. I start all of my colts that way. I actually have a bit that is just on a leather thong that I hang in their mouths while I'm doing groundwork and it allows them just to get acclimated to having a piece of metal in their mouth. And most of the time after 15 or 20 minutes, they're kind of done playing with it. They figure it out and they hold it from that point forward. And, and I definitely have happy mouths on my horses. They're not vice prone. Um, so the adjustment of the bit is a major one. Another one is the width of the bit. Um, a, a standard width for what I'll call standard size horses, horses from like 14 to 16 hands regardless of breed, uh, you, you'd generally be looking at a five to a five and a half inch wide mouth. So this width from my index finger to index finger right there. Um, ponies be smaller, draft horses might be larger. Uh, one thing we want to be very conscious of is that we have a bit that is wide enough for our horse's mouth for them to be comfortable. You're always good with a little bit extra, but, but if it's a little too narrow, again, that doesn't promote that happy mouth and you will always have some lateral pressure on the sides of your horse that he's being asked to ignore. If, if your bit winds up, let's say you have a half an inch hanging out either side, then when I'm picking up on the rein and pulling that through, the friction of that bit sliding a half inch side to side actually becomes part of my signal. Uh, so it can actually lead to a horse riding lighter. It's really not a problem at all. Now we wouldn't want that exaggerated uh, because gravity is going to cause those rings to come in and seek the side of the horse's face. If I had this bit on like a miniature horse, it obviously would be hanging like so. And that's ridiculous. But the width of the bit, quite important. Um, the other thing that the horse or you can change is the metal that the bit is made out of. I don't know if the camera's picking it up, but uh, I selected this bit specifically because it is somewhat rusted. Uh, this is a sweet iron bit, also known as cold rolled steel, uh, and it will rust. And that actually is a beneficial factor of the bit. Um, there are various alloys that are pretty popular right now. Stainless steel is becoming more and more common. Uh, and unfortunately, 
really unfortunately. We still have the uh, the chrome plated crap that you'll find at your local tax store for five dollars or twelve dollars, the, the cheapest common denominator that you can buy. If you own one of those, throw it away. That they're absolutely worthless. They flake off in a horse's mouth. Terrible, terrible, terrible. I would rather ride in a halter than a bit like that. Um, I, I I can say from my experience. I have not been very impressed with any of the alloyed steels. Um, I, I see quite a few horses that that wind up playing with a bit too much and don't really have what I consider a happy mouth with those. Some of them make them salivate excessively. Um, and, you know, I want a horse to salivate. I want them to have a relaxed jaw that leads to a relaxed neck. I want them to be swallowing and kind of working the bit a little. But, you know, if they've got foam falling out, man, that just, that's ridiculous. Uh, stainless steel, I have found to be fine with some horses, but I don't really find it to be uh, very widely accepted. Maybe 75% of horses will be fine with it. 25% of them don't seem to like it quite so much. Um, for my money and in my experience, the, the way to go is sweet iron with copper inlay. Uh, on the back side of the bit, the part that would actually lay on the horse's tongue, they'll frequently have little grooves and they'll solder in some copper or they'll have dots or something like that. Uh, hands down, the best way to go as far as I'm concerned. I don't really even play with anything else. I have a few bits uh, that are predominantly copper. Uh, this one right here is the one I like quite a bit and it's got a copper mouth, but again, probably three quarters of horses like that fine and maybe a quarter of them don't. There were all sorts of myths uh, when copper first came about being used for bits. Uh, some people said that it, it caused mares to not cycle and, and all sorts of things. None of that's true. Uh, I have heard that the real thing with the copper and the sweet iron is the combination. Uh, one of them is sweet, one of them is sour. So some horses will like either, but when you put them together, that's really, it's like chocolate and peanut butter. It's that magical mix uh, that comes into work. So those are the, the three things I would really find to be the most important about any, any uh, snaffle bit or, or really any bit, bar none, because it, it is important because no matter how skilled you are or how trained the horse is, there's nothing either of you can do about it. It is what it is that deals with setup. Again, that's the adjustment in the horse's mouth, the width of the bit, and then the type of metal that the bit is made of. Um, next, we'll go on to the actual mouthpiece itself. Um, this is one of those areas that I feel like gets way, way overblown. Um, I tend to be very, very simple. A bit like this is pretty much my bread and butter. Uh, I, I tend to ride mostly young horses and problem horses. Uh, this is the type of bit I would spend 90% of my time riding in. I have horses all the time brought to me that have some big honking bit in their mouth and they've got all sorts of head problems. Their head's way up here. Uh, I back them down into something like this and generally fix it pretty easily. Um, so I, I really, really would encourage you to stay pretty simple on the mouthpiece. Now, with the mouthpiece, we've got a few things that, that do matter. The diameter, uh, this is a 7 16th inch uh, mouthpiece, which is kind of the standard, I would tend to say. Uh, it's about as big a mouthpiece as I ever tend to ride. I, I probably spend more time riding in a 3 8 which would be 1 16th of an inch smaller, barely any smaller. But when you see people that have got one of these big rubber plugs in a horse's mouth that's about like that, I mean, how would you feel if that were in there? It's just two. It's like the difference between chewing on a toothpick and a one-inch dowel. You know, a toothpick's pretty comfortable in your mouth. A one-inch dowel is just too big. That's the same sort of thing. I never see a horse carrying a bit like that that has that happy mouth and that seems seems happy with it. They're, they're just, they're always messing with it. And that's a vice as far as I'm concerned. Uh, now you can get on the other end of the spectrum here. I try to take some of these off a of headstall so they're a little easier for me to show y'all. This is a, a tiny twisted wire. Um, 
I seldom ride this bit in all honesty it probably hasn't been on a horse in a couple of years uh, I do occasionally find one that it it is the uh, it helps me along with a bit but uh, this is about a quarter of an inch diameter which is about as small as you would go I personally think you should have to have a license to ride with something like this I won't say there's never a time and a place for it but 99.9% uh, .9 of people have absolutely they don't have the hands to ride with something like this you, you can do quite a bit of damage with that if you don't uh, if you're not handling it properly um, okay so that's mouthpiece diameter there are a couple of other factors uh, like this this particular bit has a little bit of mullen to it what mullen is is roundness of the mouthpiece so um, right here this one has an absolutely straight mouthpiece uh, I would generally say that, that a straighter mouthpiece is a little more severe um, and you could even take a mullen type mouthpiece if we were to put another joint in the middle of this and we were to have like a dog bone or a doctor bristol or a lifesaver or any of those that add another joint in the middle that's simply going to wrap around that horse's jaw a bit more it's going to alleviate a bit of bar pressure and and kind of more evenly distribute the weight uh, frankly i tend to not care for those those bits very much uh, they tend to give me a bit of a duller feel in my horse i won't say that that's always true but uh, I, I generally don't don't care for them much i would much rather kind of just the plain version if i really do want to sharpen a horse up i mean let me say this truly the most important part of any of these these bits that i'm showing you are the hands on the reins the, the differences between these mouthpieces are, are quite subtle and I would really say that most people, 99% of people, don't have enough feel in their hands to actually tell the difference in the bits. Um, for instance, if, if I were to put you on a horse and blindfold you and then give you some hands and have you pick up on the reins and ride around a little bit, there's no way you could tell me what kind of bit was in that horse's mouth. Uh, so, so don't get so wrapped up in the mouthpieces. Your hands have way more to do with how well that works out than the mouthpiece does. Uh, but the diameter certainly can come into play as to how severe that is. Um, here's one thing I do want to say. Like, like when, when we get into leverage bits, we'll talk about pulling one pound and the horse may feel three. Well, people generally say with snaffles, you pull one pound, the horse feels one pound. That's true, but does the horse feel one pound spread over an area this wide or an area this wide? Uh, and, and that's where the diameter of that bit comes in. When I pull one pound on a 7 16th inch mouthpiece like this, that's going to be a, a much milder feel to a horse than if I pulled one pound on that tiny twisted wire down there. So, um, again, it's one of those things people tend to think of snaffles as being mild, and that's, that's really not, not necessarily true. Um, something else that'll come into play is the ring. All right. Now I do tend to ride with O-rings. You have probably noticed that. Um, I, I don't really think this is something people need to get wrapped up in. I would say an O-ring would also be cons considered a loose ring bit if you can see that this slides around. One good thing about that that I like uh, is that a horse can play with that mouthpiece a little bit with his tongue and the mouthpiece itself is all he has to pick up because it can move up and down on those rings. If I have a D-ring or an egg butt or something and the horse is trying to pick up the mouthpiece, in addition to the mouthpiece, he also has to pick up the rings of the bit because they're fixed. Um, so I, I would say a, a minor difference between a loose ring and a, a D-ring or egg butt type snaffle would be that this would, would tend to promote a little bit looser jaw to me. Now obviously if you uh, ride English or something and you show up at a show with an O-ring snaffle, they're probably going to laugh you out of the arena. So, uh, you know, I'll leave that up to you. I mean, this definitely tends to be more a cowboy style bit. But in all honesty, the difference between O-ring, D-ring, egg butt, full cheek, half cheek, whatever, 
is, is really pretty minor. I wouldn't wouldn't really recommend that you get too wrapped up in that. Again, if I blindfolded you and had you pick up on some reins, you'd have no idea what kind of ring was attached. Um, okay. Now, now we'll talk a little bit about some other mouthpieces. Twisted wire. Ooh, there's there's a hornet's nest waiting to be kicked. Um, twisted wire. It is severe. Um, this is one I ride a fair bit, especially when I go to, to start colts on cattle. Uh, after maybe a month on cattle, first month I want to give them the cow a good bit. Second month I want to start taking it back and, and, and refining them on a cow. Um, <laughs> this is sort of a fast twist. And again, if we're looking at the surface area, all this is really doing is when I'm pulling down on the reins, rather than pulling on the solid bar, He's only feeling it at the high spots. Okay? I, I see quite a few places where they will say that the more twists you have, the more severe it is. I, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. Uh, and I can tell you, practically speaking, between these two, uh, this one definitely has more bite to it than this one does. They're the same diameter. Now, this one has a little bit of mullein. This one is straight. But this is, is what's uh, considered a slow twist. So when I'm pulling on this bit, rather than contacting in, I don't know, seven or eight places, it's only contacting in three or four. And, and uh, it, it has, this is also a square twist. Uh, and I hope y'all can see that. It's a square twist. So this really, this bit has a decent bit of bite to it. Uh, you know, it's probably right on the cusp of the sort of thing that not just anybody needs to ride with. Whereas this bit, you'd, you'd have to be kind of off the wall to really do a whole lot of damage with it. Um, another characteristic of the rings that we'll get into. Okay. If we were to look on this bit. This would be what uh, English people might consider a Bradoon uh, snaffle. It's got a fairly small diameter mouth and a very lightweight ring. Um, I haven't ridden this bit in a long time. Probably, uh, it's. I, I probably had this thing 15 years, and I bet I haven't had it on a horse in 10 uh, because I hate the feel of it. Uh, it just doesn't have a very good feel in the horse, and it's these rings that are the problem. Uh, if we were to move up like this, might be classed as a heavy ring. Uh, horses don't learn on the pull, they learn on the release. We, we all know that. Uh, sometimes I hear people describing bits, they'll say that a heavier object releases quicker. Well, that's not true. I've had physics, and all objects fall with gravity at a rate of 9.8 meters per second squared. A heavier object doesn't fall faster, it falls at the same rate but it's more noticeable when the heavier ring is released. Uh, and that's why I don't really like this one. Horses just don't seem to notice it. It might as well be a fly on their neck. It's just insignificant. Whereas something with a little more weight to it, uh, they, they definitely will respond to that release quicker. Now, we can go off of the scale here. Here's another bridle that I don't ride very often at all. Um, this would be called a donut bit or a two pounder. Um, each of these rings is supposed to weigh two pounds. Uh, I would definitely class this as a gimmick. Uh, just too heavy doesn't make any sense. She was wearing my arm out just holding it here. Uh, I'll say that I had one paint mare that I rode back in Texas that uh, another guy had been riding and she was she was the type that didn't want you to handle her at all. She was really vulgar when he would ride her. He'd pick up on the rain. I mean, she'd just fight you. She was nasty to watch. Uh, and so they gave her to me because I was better at doing that sort of stuff. Uh, and somebody had given me this bit, and I decided to try it out on that mare. And she, would, what she would do when you would pick up on the rain, she would get mad, and she'd start slinging her head. Well, those big one-pound weights slapping her on either side when she was slinging her head. I think I rode her in this two or three days and that fixed that little problem of her. So I would really say that that was about the only time I've ever found this bit to be useful. I keep it around simply to show people. One other thing about it 
really a poorly made bit. If you can see that tube right there, there's a huge gap uh, between the ring and the, the uh, side of the bit there. That's just asking to pinch a horse. So another reason why I don't ride with it. Okay, one other thing I would like to add about snaffles is, is how they're properly rigged. Um, you'll notice all of the snaffles that I presented here today had a slobber string, curb strap, could be called a bunch of different things. Uh, but the importance of this, it should be just a little bit wider than the diameter of the mouth, is to keep that ring from turning sideways and the bit pulling through the horse's mouth. Um, <coughs> uh, I guess I primarily see this among uh, English influence riders, endurance riders, and whatnot. They tend to not have that on there. Uh, that's a safety feature, folks. I think it should be on any any snaffle that you have should have that on. It really doesn't affect anything when you work in the reins or whatnot, but it's a little bit like a seat belt. It'll never come into play until you really, really need it. You have a horse running away with you or something and you're trying to turn their head and you pull the bit through their mouth. Well, guess what? That just got worse. <laughs> uh, so this, this keeps the bit from going through the horse's mouth. I would highly encourage you uh, to, to be sure you've got something like that. And it need not be a simple string like the actual curb chain that would go on. I'll see those on here sometime. Uh, that's far too long. It, it, that's improper. You shouldn't have that on there. But you know, something needs to be on there. Now, uh, I will show you all one little thing that I tend to do. Uh, the traditional way to rig that would be to have it between the rein and the mouthpiece of the bit, and you'll see that I have mine behind it. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more in the other video about transition bits. But th my reasoning for that is that one of the scariest parts of a transition bit is when we add chin pressure. Um, and again, we'll talk more about that in the next video. But I figure, I've been doing this a long, long time, at least 15, maybe 20 years, uh, as I'm picking up on this rein, you'll see I'm lifting that string and it's touching the horse under the chin. It's not really putting any pressure on him, but he does feel something there. And, and to my mind, that might make my transition a little bit easier for the horse, a little smoother uh, when I do go up into a, 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 a transition shank bit and I'm adding curb pressure or chin pressure for the first time. I can tell you that I've never ever, I've got thousands and thousands of horses I've ridden like this. I've never seen any negative effect of it. Um, plus I get to have all kind of people come up to me and tell me how I'm rigged wrong. You know, but that'd be the only negative effect I've ever had. But, but as far as how it affects horses, you'll never notice a difference. I would like to think maybe on some of them it helps a little bit with that chin pressure thing. Uh, okay, what I would like to, to go over, there's one thing about rings that I left out, but I'm going to, I have it here in my little series of things that happens with a snaffle bit when we pick up our reins. Um, hopefully if you have your bit adjusted the way I, I had talked about earlier, the very first thing that will happen when you take all of the slack out of the rein is that you're going to pick up one of these rings, one side of it, and you're going to make contact with the corners of the mouth. And it should be, you know, my bit isn't really hanging in the horse's mouth. It's just that far below the corner of the mouth. So the first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to make contact with the corner of the mouth. If, to me, a horse riding light, that's really where that ends. I, I make contact with the corner and boom, their nose comes right on through for me and we're, we're doing whatever I was asking them to do. Um, if they don't respond to that, sort of the series that happens. We'll touch the corners of the mouth. Um, we are then pulling slightly on the tongue. Uh, like I said, depending on specific type of mouthpiece would, depend, would determine to what degree we're pulling on the tongue. But we would be touching the tongue at that point. If we compress the tongue more, then we're gonna start making contact with the bars, that gum line of the horse. Um, and, and at the same time, we're coming into contact. We've pulled the, the bit through the horse's mouth where that offside ring is going to start making pressure on the horse's mouth. Now, I will say this. You don't ever see it with an O-ring, but, but occasionally with a D-ring on the inside of the D, sometimes they'll have a bar right there. And, and what that is, it's to make that bit a little more severe so that instead of 
the entire surface area of that ring pressing on the horse's face, it's only pushing on the bar. Okay? Um, not going to say that is a wrong or a right thing. I just think that you should recognize it in a bit. And, and I always think the important thing is not how severe the potential your bit has to be, but whether you recognize that it has the potential to be severe. So if you're riding with a bit that's more severe than you think it is, I think you need to know that. Um, so, so that ring can come into more play there than we think. One of the other things we need to be careful about, if your horse has some teeth problems, maybe some sharp edges on the top, as that ring is coming into play, it does have the ability to touch those first molars. And if they have some sharp edges, sometimes we'll have a horse that's, when that makes contact, they'll start tossing their head. That, that could be a good indication of teeth problems. Now, let me say right here, um, uh, teeth are important. I believe in equine dentistry and, and having that taken care of on an annual basis. Uh, one of the things I primarily ride two year olds, I think people get way over blown about wolf teeth. Um, for those of you who may not know, uh, wolf teeth, they are not the, the teeth one inch back from the horse's front teeth. Those are the canines or the tusks. They generally come into a horse from four to six years. Some people will incorrectly think that's what wolf teeth are. It is not. Wolf teeth are unrooted premolars that sit right in front of the horse's uh, mouth. I kind of wish I had a horse's head here right now. But uh, one thing I don't think people realize, if we were to look at the side of a horse's head, let's say his head was right here and his lip came up, their, their molars and whatnot don't start anywhere near the corner of the horse's mouth. You'd have to stick your finger in there and reach. They're, they're good that far behind the corner of the mouth. So people worry about a bit coming into contact with wolf teeth. Um, you've, you've really done some pulling on him and had him smiling pretty significantly before you're touching teeth. Now, a horse can, like I was talking about earlier, they can suck that bit up into their mouth and chew on it a little bit. That would be what we'd call taking it in their teeth. And I generally don't, don't want to see that. But uh, you really don't have nearly as much concerns of, of your bit hitting teeth as, as I find a lot of people uh, think that there is. That, that really shouldn't be, practically speaking, a, a concern. If we're hitting teeth, uh, we, we've got a lot of things going, going bad there to address uh, it's not necessarily a dental issue it's probably a much more training issue or, or some pretty bad hands um, so with, with any of these bits that little series of things what what happens when I take the slack out of this rain that's really something I would like for all of you to, to, to be thinking of uh, with a bit when you come across a bit that has nine different doodads on it and it's so complicated that you can't figure out what happens when I pick up the rain. Well, probably the horse can't figure it out either. Uh, I, I generally want to stay simple. If it's that complicated, ah, I don't really need that. My hands are a lot more important than than having all of those doodads on a bit. Some people really get ridiculous. I, I'll say comfortably that uh, the majority of bits out there are designed to do nothing more than sell a bit probably 90% of them on that tack wall in your local store uh, need to just be chunked in the garbage. Most of them are pointless or, or you know, again, the variation between them is so subtle as to be uh, unnecessarily, uh, unnecessary in time. Well, that's been a bit about snaffles. We may have a follow-up video or, or some few things to add, but uh, I think that's a that's a good bit of information on snaffles and the various types of mouthpieces and the things that are important to know about them and that aren't important to know, like your hands are most important and the only severe part of any bit. So, Daniel Dolphin with Dolphin Horsemanship, I hope that that's been helpful to you and you've learned something. May the horse be with you.